أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وروح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي so dear brothers and sisters alhamdulillah allah has given us another night to be here in the tents of imam al hussein and inshallah tonight we're going to be talking about a new promise of god another one of allah's promises what we learned was this that if we have hope hope allows us to harness those energies that we have within and to do great things, to do big things. Some people may use hope, if their lives are filled with hope, to fulfill worldly desires, to achieve, succeed. There's some people who say, no, I even have things that are more important than my worldly desires. Yes, if I have hope, I can use that, I can benefit, and my worldly dreams can come true. But I have spiritual ambitions. They realize that actually not having hope is one of the reasons they're not able to achieve their spiritual dreams and their spiritual ambitions, so they need to hear about hope for that reason. So we're going to be talking, inshallah, tonight we'll be talking about, I mean, the brothers will be reciting and remembering the ashab of Imam al Hussein, those companions of the Imam. And think about it, if you and I were there with our Imam fighting, do you know what it's like? to be fighting when you're outnumbered 400 to 1? Not only that, but you're surrounded by enemies in a desert. You have women and children with you. There's no way you're going to make it out. What is your hope? What keeps you going? For sure, one of the things that keeps them going and kept them going was their belief in Allah's promises. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, Wa'adallaha that Allah's promise is true, وَمَنْ أَسْتَقُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا And who is more true in speech than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, brothers and sisters, in our discussion tonight, we're going to realize something. What happens is, sometimes what keeps us from becoming those soldiers of the imam, or experiencing God's best, not being mediocre, being special for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being special for the cause, are not external obstacles, but rather they're internal. Sometimes it's not the case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't given us chances. No, He has given us chances. He's given us opportunities. He's given us times where we can make a big difference. But the person themselves, they shy away from it. This is my chance to do something good. But because of doubts, insecurities, fears, the person keeps themselves back from achieving their true potential. Otherwise, we learned this in the hadith, it says this, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ فِي أَيَامِ دَحْرِكُمْ نَفَحَاتِ That definitely, over the course of your lives, there are times when divine breezes blow. Allah gives opportunities. And the hadith says, أَلَا فَتَرَسَّدُوا لَهَا be on the lookout for those special opportunities. The believer is supposed to be looking for that. So it's not the case that the believer never got those chances, but the believers stopped themselves, him or her. Sometimes these opportunities may start to, these divine breezes may blow in our personal lives. There's times when Allah gives us chances in our personal lives. For instance, let's say somebody wanted to get married, right? This is the opportunity, but they shrink away from it. No, I, this wouldn't work for me. Doubts. Sometimes, no, somebody's been married before. It didn't work out the first time. Now is their chance to go again, but they tell themselves, no. The sisters can't defend themselves, so let me say something on behalf of the sisters. The sisters might say, for instance, all men are pigs. Forget about it. No need. Maybe it's a brother who should be trying again, but instead of trying again, he says, no, who wants to be pinned down, right? Allah's presenting opportunities. Allah's presenting opportunities. Sometimes there's more than this, though. 
Sometimes, actually, we've done something in our personal lives. We've had success. Sometimes our problem is settling where we are. Allah can do bigger things for us, greater things for us. For instance, perhaps when those divine breezes blow, in my life, maybe it's the time to start a new career or open a business, not work for the man, right? There's different opportunities that come in people's lives. Sometimes it's not any of these. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you have a chance because of your iman to do something that's going to affect the direction of the community. You have a chance to make Allah proud. You have a chance to go over and stand up for what is true. Say what you need to say. And if you say that, it's going to change the direction of the community. Sometimes it all rides on one person. So these are opportunities. The person can be that special mu'min or mu'mina, but the person sometimes they talk themselves out of these opportunities. One story from Karbala. One story from Karbala. All of the stories in Karbala, as you know, all of them aren't happy. They aren't all happy endings. There are some people who had opportunities to change things. They simply had to follow that guidance Allah had given them, but the person stepped away from it. They wouldn't do what they knew they should do, and everything changed. One of these individuals was a person named Shurey. Who's Shurey? Let's, I'm going to borrow your, or lean on the information that you already have from Karbala. If you remember, when Muslim first goes into Kufa, there's a weak governor in charge of Kufa. There's some evil individuals, some people who understand what's going on. They tell Yazid, if you want to get control of Kufa, you need to send a strong man here. Yazid gives the information to Ubaidullah. He says, Ubaidullah, you keep Basra, go to Kufa. Ubaidullah, if you remember the story, when he first enters Kufa, he only comes in with a few retainers. He doesn't have control of the city yet. Muslim has been there before that. Of course, Muslim has been working underground, but Muslims made effort. People have made bay'ah. Things are moving in a certain direction. Ubaidullah comes in. Now, Ubaidullah's plan is to put a lot of stress and duress on the mu'mineen. He captures somebody. He tricks them to coming to his place. A man named Hani. Remember that story I told you guys yesterday where there was a chance for Muslim to kill Ubaidullah? That was in the house of Hani. Hani is tricked into coming into the castle. When he's tricked into coming into the castle, you remember in the story, he's disrespected, he's put in prison. He's put in prison. Hani has a big tribe, a powerful tribe. Hani's tribe surrounds the castle. Things could change one way or the other. The community can move in one way or it can move in the other way. What happens? The, 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 tri the tribe is angry. They're upset. You've captured our guy. He's inside. They're ready to storm the castle. Ubaidullah realizes what he has to do. Shurey is a qadi. He's a judge. He tells Shurey, he says, come in here and tell those people, look at Hani, he's still alive. Go tell everybody that honey is okay. This is the test now. Sometimes it's all in your hands. What does honey have to do? Honey's a judge. Everybody's going to listen to him. Either I go out, I'm brave, I tell everybody, honey's inside, break down the doors, get honey out. History will be changed. But they might kill me. The guard's standing right with me. Shurey decides to play it safe. Shurey comes out. He says, no, no, he's still alive. History changes. The crowd leaves. History changes. So sometimes, brothers and sisters, those divine breezes that blow, they're a chance for you and I to make a difference. If we do what our taklif is, what our responsibility is, we can make something change in the way for the imam. Right? So those opportunities come into people's lives. And what we're going to try and do is find out what those, uh, what those obstacles are and then what God's promises are and how we can counter these things that stop us from experiencing God's best. So in that long journey that we call life, brothers and sisters, with all of its ups and downs, with all of its ups and downs, and of course we know God wants us to experience his best, we said that sometimes what keeps us from experiencing God's best are not those external problems, but rather 
those internal ones, those doubts, those feelings of I'm not good enough, I'm not ready. Well, I should be brave, I should be adventurous, I should step out in faith, I should believe, I should leave a little, live a little. But I tell myself, no, it's not the time. I'll keep playing it safe. I'll settle where I am. Right? I never experience God's best. Sometimes it's an external obstacle. It's an external obstacle. But external obstacles are very different, brothers and sisters. Maybe you've noticed this. If someone came to you and told you, I personally, I'm going to stand in the way of your dream. I refuse to allow you to live your dream. I'm going to stop you. What would happen? You push back. If you're American, what we say is, oh, now it's on. Now it's on. No, you're going to stop. You're going to really stop me from achieving my dream? But the other thing that I'm talking about, those internal doubts, are those times when nobody's stopping me on the outside. It's me on the inside. I give up. I could go. I could make something. I could do something. I tell them, no, it's not the time. Not me. I'm not ready. Not my time. Not now. I keep playing it safe when I should be experiencing God's best. Instead of me believing Allah's promises, I'm holding myself back. And that, brothers and sisters, is what we're going to be careful about. Okay? So we know that we'll resist if somebody tries to force us, impose their will on us. We're going to resist. You know what happens, though, with these whispers? Sometimes it's internal. Somebody like myself. The whispers happen. We hear them. All of us have them. There's times when we get little doubts that creep in. Sometimes it's not actually inside. Sometimes it's another person. Sometimes other people will put doubts in your minds. Sometimes other people are dream killers. They'll come over very calmly. They'll adjust their glasses and talk you out of your dreams. Tell you how you can't make it. It's not going to work. Instead of your heart being full of hope and Allah's going to make a way for me, they keep talking to you, explaining to you, no, it's not going to work for you. Why are you doing this? It's ridiculous. You'll never make it. Settle for something. They talk me out of that. One of my personal favorites, not my personal favorite, one of the things I don't like when people are dream killers is this. In order to get you to stop following your dream, they start bringing up possibilities for you. Maybe this is going to happen. Maybe that. Just stay where you are. Right? Just talk you out of it. Sometimes it's even worse than that. This is something I want parents to keep in mind. Sometimes when we were very young, sometimes for some of us when we were young, there was somebody in our life, perhaps a parent, perhaps a relative, perhaps an authority figure, somebody who came over and discouraged us from the time we were young. Either as a, you can keep this in mind as for those first seven years, you, and especially for our sisters, you can breathe confidence into your children. You can make them feel they can overcome. You can make them brave. You can tell them Allah will help them. Right? Imam Khomeini says, raise your children to be God-centered. With Allah's help, I can do everything. You can breathe that into them, explain that to them, make them confident, or God forbid people do it the other way. Sometimes people tell them, You're not talented enough. Sometimes maybe it's people bullying one another at school. You're not attractive enough. There's different things. People go over, they say these words, and it sticks. And then you're surprised years later. You're like, well, why would you have this fear? I heard it. It settled. So what happens is these are things that are there. And brothers and sisters, sometimes those whispers from other people are very tough to take. Sometimes they're extremely difficult to deal with. Again, I want to take you to Karbala. Parts of the story that you know. Imam Hussein had a mission. Imam Hussein is supposed to go over and go to Kufa. Remember from the story though, how many people from the beginning tried to talk Imam Hussein out of his mission? Don't go there. Don't go to Kufa. The people won't help you. Go to Yemen. It's difficult. Everybody telling you it's not, gonna, it's not worth it. So the tests are there. The other thing is, when we're not surrounded by good company that helps us, the other thing is that actually the social examinations and tests are difficult. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. One of the reasons for having a discussion about the divine promises is to ready ourselves for the end of time. For the end of time, there will be big tests. There will be tough tests. 
Let me share a verse of Quran with you. It says this. أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَنْ تَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثَلَ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Do you really think that you're going to enter paradise and that which happened to those who went before you, that didn't happen to you? You might ask yourself, what happened to them? مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَعْسَاءُ وَالْضَرَّاءُ Misfortune, hardship afflicted these individuals. وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَاءُ They were shaken. Until what happened? حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهُ It was so severe. The Prophet, the Mu'mineen were saying, when is Allah's help going to come? Right? There are tests, brothers and sisters. I can't lie to you. I'm going to be straight with you. There are tests. There's times when we need these divine promises to be able to keep hope and keep going and then experience God's best. So now, what we're doing, brothers and sisters, is this. We don't want to be negative. We want to look for hope. We want to look for solutions, practical ways of applying these lessons, lessons that we're finding in the Holy Quran. Things are going to change our lives, allow us to experience God's best. So one of the promises that's there, that inshallah we'll be discussing is this. What is it that we need in order to succeed against those doubts? We have to rid ourselves of fear. Those doubts, those worries. For us, the future has to be bright. It has to be clear. We have to know we can do it, right? It's necessary for us. So what is God's promise to the believers? There are several verses. I'm going to be sharing two, inshallah. One of them is the promise where Allah says that he gives the believers itminan. Allah gives the believers certainty. Allah gives the believers tranquility. Right? When others are going over and giving them those doubts, making them give up, making them lose hope, the believers, no, no, I know it's going to be all right. I have that tranquility, that peace, that inner peace. And that's very important for the believers. The verse of Quran is this, it says, Know this, with the remembrance of Allah, the hearts have peace. And this is inner peace, brothers and sisters. I want to describe what, I'm dis- what I mean by tranquility. I'll give you an example. Let's say that there is two individuals, and they both have a very important test to pass. In America, if you want to go to the university, there's a test called the SAT. It's a very important test. For us in America, it's an important test. Let's say there was somebody who had studied very well for their examination. They take in classes, courses. Let's say they even had other people test them. Ask me questions. Right? I've read my books. I'm ready. Right? How does this person feel? And let's say there was somebody else, and this individual, they hadn't studied at all. They goofed off. They played video games. And now I'm coming to this big test. The state of that first person is the one, the first person, the one who studied, that's Ithminan. The other person who knows, I don't have a chance in hell to make it out. That's the person who has that fear and that worry. So it doesn't mean, when I say tranquility though, it doesn't mean, brothers and sisters, that there will never be stress on the outside. That you as a believer, if you have peace and tranquility, if you're connected with God subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there's never going to be external tests. No, those will be there. Karbala, right? Karbala, who didn't have stress then? That was tough, right? That internal peace is something different. Knowing what the path is, not having those doubts, that's something that's inner, that's different. Now, I'm going to mention a story, right? A story, and then after that, I'll, I'll talk about something else. I don't know how many of you got a chance to see this. There was a shaheed recently, a guy named Mohsin Hujaji. He became shaheed recently. He was over there, one of the brothers who was over there as the defenders of the haram. And this individual was captured by Daesh. And Allah wanted us to see what a shaheed looks like before you cut off his head, before he loses his life. So you see this individual, and you see him looking at the camera. His eyes are haunting. He's captured by Daesh. The picture that you've seen, he's been shot from one side, he has shrapnel on him from the other side, and he knows he's going to become shaheed. By the way, this individual, he had prayed for martyrdom. His wife tells the story. His wife is like the wife of Zuhair. 
If you listen to her story, she says that I was pregnant when my first husband signed up. He told me, don't tell anyone that I'm pregnant. Maybe they'll say that you can't go. Your wife's pregnant. You can't go. He said, don't tell anyone. She said, I didn't tell anyone. She said, I was the one who was encouraging him. She said, while the, the, the papers were going through, this guy was going to the majalis. This guy was fasting, hoping for this opportunity. When he finally got it, that's when you see the picture of him going over and kissing his father, his father's hands, his, his mother's hands, their feet. That's when he got, that, he got information that he's going to be able to go. So what happens is, part of his story is this. He was told three times before he becomes martyred by the shohada from his team that he's going to be martyred. So he knows, right? We're talking about itminan now. He knows what's about to happen. You know what happened to that shaheed? As he had asked Allah for martyrdom, but a martyrdom that wasn't easy. He was decapitated, but before he was decapitated, he was burnt and he was tortured. Right? So this individual, before that, so I'm not promising you that as a mu'min you'll never face duress. No, there's difficulties, there's trials, there's tests. But that inner peace to know what the mission is, what I'm supposed to do, not to panic. Right? That's the part that's very important for us. So now, there are several verses that talk about this, maybe four or five verses that promise us that the believer under duress, under duress, will receive tranquility and peace. They'll be able to find out what their direction is. They'll be able to make the right decisions. They won't panic, right? Allah's going to give that to them. But first, let me answer another question. The first part of the question, so that, that tranquility, inshallah, we'll talk about it. In addition to that, what do I tell? We talk practical now. What do I tell those doubts that come in? Because part of me not achieving my true position with God was those doubts, those whispers that would come in. How do I overcome those? With those, what we'll do is we'll look at those other promises of Allah. The other promises of Allah that we already covered were this. In Allah, la yukallifu nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah places no burden on a soul except to the extent of its ability. So that means no matter what my test is, no matter what my trial is, I have already been equipped to come through. I already have all the tools that I need. I am the right race the right gender. I've got enough talent. I've got enough discipline. I can make this happen. Allah's promised me, la yukallafu Allahu nafsan illa wasaha. I can overcome this. Allah doesn't burden me with a burden that's greater than I can bear. So by going back to Allah's promises, I can shake off those doubts. I am capable. I can make it happen. Now the next part. The next part is how Allah sends you down, sends down tranquility for you in those times when it's extremely difficult. This one I want to share a story with you. This story that I'm going to show you is a story from the Quran. But this story is one that teaches us an important spiritual lesson. Question. What is the difference between having belief in the self, having confidence based on Allah's promises, and being arrogant? Western confidence. Western confidence. Knowing that I've got it under control. What's the difference? When do we say this is positive? This is from Allah. Allah likes this. When do we say no? This is now me relying on myself. We're going to learn this from the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the battle of Hunayn. The battle of Hunayn, brothers and sisters, if we remember that battle, this is in the year after the conquest of Mecca. So Mecca's fallen. When Mecca had fallen... There were some tribes. Three tribes gathered, and they had decided to nip Islam in the bud. These tribes are going to go over, and they're going to attack. The prophet goes over to stop these individuals. We march out. We Muslims march out with an army to go over and stop these individuals. Our number is 10,000. When we go to Mecca, another 2,000 join us. For those Muslims who had seen the times of Badr and Uhud, and other battles, they thought, start thinking that now we've got it under control. They felt invincible. We have 12,000 people, Muslims, we're marching. No one can stop us. We are invincible. The believers are marching with that attitude, and they go to this area. Brothers and sisters, there's something for us to keep in mind. If ever you and I, instead of us relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we start to rely on ourselves independently of God. 
I've got this. Because Allah's going to help you. No, I got it. I understand. I know. When Allah sees that kind of arrogance, relying on yourself, not him, then God's going to test you. God has ways of testing believers. Anybody who stops being vigilant, especially when you've taken some steps in spirituality. Because in spirituality, what we learn, no, I'm supposed to believe in myself, believe in the divine help. Allah can help me. But if I ever start to count on myself, that's the time when it gets scary. These Muslims, they started to count on themselves. They felt invincible. And what happened was they entered into the area after Fajr. They're expecting a normal battle. We're going to go over. The enemy is going to be in a certain area. We've got our 12,000 people. They march into this valley. When they marched into the valley with that kind of arrogance, the enemy came and attacked them from an elevated position. They were throwing rocks at them, arrows from every direction. The vanguard of the Muslims, they panicked. And then the fear became contagious. The believers started running. Helter skelter. Everybody save your lives. And the enemy is coming after the believers, chasing them down. Once that panic happened, the prophet's calling out to the believers. People just keep running. They said there was a man, Abu Jarwal. This guy was riding on a, let's tell you the little details of the battle, riding on a red-haired camel, leading the horde, coming after the believers. They said he had a spear, and he would just be ramming it right through the believers. And he's coming right after them. So what happened at this time? This is now the practical part. What our duty is, in the times of extreme duress, in addition to already we know that I'm capable of handling these responsibilities, I have to believe that Allah is going to help me. Stand firm, do my responsibility. When that happened, when the believers stood firm and did their responsibility, God says something happened to the believers. He says, When God saw that resistance, the believers standing, he sent down that tranquility. Amir al-Mu'mineen came and he took out that guy. The few believers who were there, they started resisting. Other believers joined. And then Allah granted victory to the believers. But it's necessary for the believers to believe those promises, to stand firm. And then Allah sends his help. So if the believer does that, then yes, that tranquility, that sakina that is sent down. And the believers are able to stand firm. They're able to do their responsibilities. So what do we learn from this? Brothers and sisters, under all circumstances, we have to be sure about Allah's promises. We have to do our responsibility also, though. That's a big part of it. What is my responsibility right now as I wait for the Calvary to arrive? If I do my responsibility, I hold firm, then Allah sends out tranquility, then I can relax and then I can operate properly. If I refuse to, well, then there's other results. I'm hearing a story once. They said once, there was a husband and wife. They went to the doctor. The husband was very sick. When they went to the doctor, the doctor ran some tests on the husband. He said, no, these are some very serious conditions. So he told the husband, he said, go ahead and leave the room. The wife said that, you know what? I want to hear what's really happening. Tell it to me straight. What's going to happen? What's the situation of this guy? She said, your husband's condition is very, very serious. There's only one way for him to make it out. Really? What do I have to do? They said that you have to tell your husband every day, tell him you love him. You have to give him three meals a day. You have to pamper him. You have to look after all of his needs. If you do that, your husband will survive. She came out of the doctor's office. Her husband told, looked at her, said, what happened? He said, what's the situation? She said, you're going to die. So the first part of it, I have to do my responsibilities. I have to hold firm. God's given me direction. I hold firm. And then I expect Allah's responsibilities. Now, the other thing I want to do is explain how this happens. I want to give one last story. And then inshallah we'll have our masaib. One last Quranic story for us to see, again, how these principles are. The confidence, knowing that Allah's going to help me. And then after that, those other steps that we're supposed to take. Our responsibility, if we were at the time of Nabi Musa, was to resist Fir'aun. To resist Fir'aun. Jazakumullah khairan. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sallu 
The responsibility of the believers in the time of Fir'aun was to resist. Fir'aun was a terrible tyrant. He was their slave master. And many of them had been institutionalized. The instructions came to Musa for the Mu'mineen to flee Pharaoh, to escape from Pharaoh's army. And the believers set off with Musa at the command. They left. What happened was that once Pharaoh found out what was happening, then Pharaoh sent his hordes after them. And the two groups saw one another. When the two groups saw one another, some of the believers told Musa, they said, now we've been captured. There's no way we're making out. Musa did what we're supposed to do. Musa believed the divine promises. What did Musa say? Musa said, Kalla inna ma'ya rabbi sayyahdeen. He said, never. My Lord is with me. He's going to way, make a way out for me. Think about it. You're running towards the ocean. There's no way. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's uh, army is chasing behind you. There's no way out. But Musa still said, no, with me is my Lord. He's going to help me. What we learn from our hadith, brothers and sisters, is if we do our part, we're supposed to expect divine help. The Imam says, the sixth Imam says this, expect the unexpected more than you expect the norm. Expect that God will open up doors for you. God can make it happen for you. All I have to do is do my responsibility. They did that, then God opened up the ocean, the sea. The sea parted for them, and they were able to escape. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us true believers who believe in his, his promises and inshallah become the true companions of the Imam of the time. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.